Today I'd like to、uh, describe to you the lessons we have learned from the last three major nuclear accidents. Hopefully、uh, we learn the lessons and we won't have any、uh, nuclear accident in the future anymore. But let me raise one important question too. We have learned some lessons. The question is, have we? Have we truthfully learned the lessons? So, what I would like to do is to show you my conclusion slide first, and that is the bottom line messages I will deliver to you today. And the conclusions are: one, in order to prevent the next major nuclear accident, we should. Build a safety culture first. Two, we should implement the independent verification step. This is a very important step in the quality assurance process, and which is required in the operational procedures,、uh, severe accident guidelines, as well as the、um, construction procedures. The last element I like to emphasize is. Is that we should constantly exercise the probabilistic risk assessment, and I will describe these in more detail in the next fifteen minutes. So the question I'm asking today: Have we learned the three major accidents before? Truthfully, of course,、uh, this involves a lot of details, and we don't have much time. So today, although I list the the three my island accident here, but I will not spend much time talk about it. Why? Because that I know that all the lessons from the three my island are implemented already, and、um, all the resolutions also have been successfully addressed. So I will focus on the Fukushima accident as well as the. The, the the Chernobyl accident. So let me begin with a story that、uh, occurred forty years ago. It's about my own、uh, work. Forty years ago, I was fortunate enough to participate in a project. It's called the NREP. I'm sorry, IREP. I means interim, interim reliability evaluation program. That is a、um, ORC project. Now, having、uh, several nuclear utilities participating、uh, voluntarily, and the purpose of that project was to,、um, for everyone, build up a full-size PRA to get some experience, as well as for these plants to learn some insight about their own nuclear power plant.、Uh, the IREP program. Uh, happened in early 1980s.、Uh, indeed, a few years later,、uh, the whole nation、uh, began with the so-called NRAP, the National Reliability Evaluation Program, as the next step. So the IRAP was finished successfully. The NRAP was finished successfully also. And by the mid 1990s, practically all nuclear power plants in the United States have、uh, implemented something called IPE, the Individual Plan Examination. It was a, a, a remarkable achievement because、um, everybody did it. Everybody got a lot of insight. Uh, we have learned a lot, and NRC also, after a few years later, announced that、um, using PRA will be a licensing tool as well as a licensing basis to judge、uh, the safety of a nuclear power plant or have any equipment changes and so forth. Now I'm going to introduce another terminology on you. IP triple E. The last two letter E E. Means external events. Now, what are the external events? Well, the tsunami, the earthquake, the flooding. These are 
the external events. Fortunately, during those years and now, we found that in the United States, tsunami and earthquake are really not a threat to the safety of the nuclear power plant. And that is in the United States. The question is, how about the rest of the world? Now, a few years after that effort, I was fortunate enough to join another group called NSAC. NSAC stands for Nuclear Safety Analysis Center. Now, this group had the mission to identify, assess, and analyze all the abnormal occurrences in nuclear power plant that could be considered at that time a safety issue. These include steam generator tube rupture, pressurized thermal shock, scram reduction, station blackout, and the Chernobyl accident itself. Uh, I remember clearly a, a senior uh, colleague of mine uh, came to me and said this. He said, Jason, this was 1987. He said, Jason, I could not believe that we still could not have the resolution to the tsunami, which is a deadly event to a nuclear power plant. This colleague, he is age 82. I know he still lives in Palo Alto, California as of today. Huh. Let me uh, give you another story. Another colleague in the same group also said this to me. He said, Jason, if we have a station blackout in a nuclear power plant, the best life station saving machine is a fire truck. I said, what? A fire truck? He said, come on, Jason. Now, come to think of this. When we have a station blackout, we have no power, we have no water. A fire truck is an independent machine that could independently deliver power as well as to transport water. Well, now, what can be better than that? I said, oh. So what's the point? The point is that in 1987, we learned two things. One, tsunami was deadly. And two, there were means that we could implement to save the nuclear power plant during a deadly event like that. Now, let me give you another story. Soon after the Fukushima accident, there were major organizations in the world. They all published a document called the white paper or position paper. Now, I read them all and uh, trying to get something out of it, I'm more, I was most impressed with one organization. IMPO, Institute of Nuclear Power Operations. They have some information published in their white paper. Most of the content describe the three fire trucks the Fukushima had at the time of the accident. The first fire truck was blown away right away. The second fire truck was at Unit 6, too far away to drive up, go through the entire devastated area to Unit 1 to save the Unit 1 emergency situation. It's too far away, cannot make it. The third fire truck also happened, was locked outside the metal gate. And guess what? And because it was a station blackout, there was no power to open the gate. So the worker had to chop down the metal gate to let the fire truck in. So what's the point? The point is 30 years ago, these nuclear safety experts knew that tsunami was deadly. And number two, there were things that could be done to save a nuclear power plant like that. The question is, who 
would care to do something about it? Who would care to do something about it? The answer, those who cared, have their power plants saved. Those who did not care, got into a lot of trouble. So, the question is this. Why uh, some kids body care? Like the um, uh, Japan uh, Tohoku Nuclear Power Plant, the Tohoku Electric Power Company, they own the Onagawa Nuclear Power Plant. They care. The question is why they care. Okay, let me change the subject. This is all about the safety culture. Because Onagawa have a great safety culture, they did everything to stop the tsunami years before tsunami came. So they did what they should have done and did it and saved the plant. This is a great example I'm going to use to explain to you what safety culture is. And also an example I'm going to use to tell you how to judge a safety culture or how to gauge a safety culture. Now, this is an Onagawa nuclear power plant. Now, the tsunami hit the Fukushima nuclear power plant as well as the Onagawa nuclear power plant at the same time. This was year 2011. And guess what? In four years time, the Onagawa built a tsunami wall only four years. Now, who would imagine that a tsunami could hit same place in four years again? Okay, whether they're gonna do it or not, whether the tsunami is gonna come or not, is irrelevant. It's all about the safety culture. This wall is 29 meters tall. Okay, this shows the building already. And uh, the Japanese language here in the slides shows that this was done in year 2015. So I am showing this example because that the Onagawa nuclear power plant built the tsunami wall in four years. They built it, it's not because the regulator asked them to do. So they built it voluntarily. And guess what? They built it very quickly. So they built it voluntarily, expeditiously, and proactively. These are the three key words to judge a safety culture. So I'm going to change the story on you because I'm going to tell you another story about the uh, Chernobyl accident. This is the RBMK nuclear power plant, and this, this is the Chernobyl power plant. Um, frankly, I have to say that this is a very clever design. Why? Well, look at it, this, this, uh, this chart, this uh, figure. Uh, the vertical grape tubes are the nuclear fuels, and the fuels are surrounded by a lot of graphite columns used as a moderator. Uh, the moderator are not shown in the figure, the reason I'm saying this is a clever design because the Russia built it uh, at a very low cost. You can tell that there's no reactor vessel, there's no containment. All the reactor functions are accomplished by these pipes, tubes, headers. And the re reactor could produce the re nuclear power to generate electricity, at the same time produce a lot of plutonium. Uh, of course, of course, they use graphite as the moderator, and from um, reactor physics perspective, it is an uh, overly moderated uh, reactor, uh, which means the uh, void coefficient is positive, not as safe as the PWRs or the BWRs, of course. But what's the point? The point is that Russia knew what they were doing. At the NSAT, the Nuclear Safety Analysis Center where I worked for, we analyzed um, the Chernobyl accident. We did thermal hydraulics analysis, 
uh, we did a reactor physics analysis. We evaluate the procedure, study the sequence of the event, and uh, we also were able to produce the two power peaks. And because there were two explosions, uh, this is what we found. The Russia knew their design. They knew what they were doing. If they had to stick to the operating procedures, they developed addressing their design. They could have avoided the accident, but they did not. What they did on that day of accident, they tried to accelerate the safety test on a piece of safety equipment. Now, they uh, failed many times before, and this time, they tried to raise the power several times, which will cause to build up high level of xenon. High level of xenon, xenon is the so-called neutron poison. According to procedure, they should have waited for another day. Let the xenon dissipate, then resume the accident. They did not. Somebody gave the order to go ahead. So in order to overcome the xenon, they had to raise the power over and over again. Also, for another reason, they want to have a higher power so they can produce a lot of steam to drive the safety equipment for the sake of producing, hopefully producing, a, a successful test. Somebody gave an order to proceed with the accident, but they should have not. They violated the procedure. Had they adhered to the procedure, they should have avoided the accident. They, the Russia violated the procedure because they ignored one very important step, the independent verification. So let somebody who uh, made a decision and go ahead and order the, the test. Uh, let me tell you another story. In year 2019, the month of June, there was a movie a mini-series seen by uh, HBO called Chernobyl. That was a great movie. I loved the movie. The movie vividly delivered all the detail of the accident and uh, very nicely the sequence of the events. Now, the point I'd like to make is this. The creator of the movie, the producer of the movie, his name is Craig Mazin. He uh, had a or interview several times with the media. During one interview, he said, he said, look, I'm not against nuclear power. What I'm against is the system. Now, my question is, what system? The political system? The, the political system of the Soviets? Uh, do we have such system today? Or, just to be fair, is there any democratic system or is there any democratic look-like system that still as of today so political such that the politics will supersede the power in the nuclear safety personnel so that this personnel will not be able to perform their job in keeping the nuclear power safe. Does that still exist today? I uh, like to raise that question as a one of the alarming message. So all these years, a lot of friends came to me and said, Jason, is nuclear power safe? To be honest with you, this is a very difficult question to answer. It's not fair to say nuclear power is safe or to say nuclear power is not safe. The best answer I have developed, actually I read it from some place, nuclear power is safe as long as we want to make it safe. So the Okinawa nuclear power plant had wanted to make it safe and the Onagawa nuclear power plant was saved. Those who did not want to make it safe were not saved. Yes, this is an alarming message, but I hope that my message is alarming enough so that it, if we do something about it, we will never have the next nuclear accident anymore. This was published just about two weeks ago. 
is an article from a Japanese newspaper called Japan Today. It says a Japan court ruled out that both the state and TAPCO, and TAPCO is, is the Tokyo Electric Power Company, they were guilty. The court said they were guilty, and TAPCO was guilty because they could have predicted the tsunami. And there were steps they could have taken to avoid the accident. They did not. So they were guilty. This is my last slide, which is the same as my first slide. Please do this so that we will never have another nuclear accident again. Number one, let's build a safety culture. Number two, let's implement the independent verification step in all procedures. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, we, we knew that, that there are procedures to be implemented, that there are steps like this, independent verification, but there could be a political system that will not let this step to be executed thoroughly. And lastly, please exercise the probabilistic risk assessment as much as we can, so that we will no longer have any nuclear accident. Thank you very much.